Hello everyone and welcome to this broadcast. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We're delighted to have you all join us this morning. And uh, this is our second HMI Data, AI and Society seminar in the series. And we're absolutely delighted, of course, to welcome the wonderful Lily Hu from Harvard University and hear more about her work. She's going to discuss what is race in algorithmic discrimination on the basis of race. And just before we get into that, I'll just do a little, um, few little announcements. Uh, Lily will speak for 30 minutes in which time please feel free to add any of your questions to the chat here on the Zoom channel. And um, then we'll have a 30 minute Q&A session. Um, and we'll have a hard stop at 10 a.m. And after that, we can continue our conversation in Slack. So without further ado, Lily, please, if you would like to start, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shell. First, I wanna say thank, thank you um, to everybody who's at HMI and making the Data AI and Society seminar series possible. They have been so gracious allowing me to join you all and give this talk in spite of a rather foolish, an extremely foolish error last week, failing to do my time zone calculation correctly. Fortunately, a brave soul um, uh, jumped right in. So Claire, I believe, thank you, um, for which I'm so grateful. So I hope today's talk will make up a bit for last week and maybe even exceed <laughs> Well, exceed what I would have done last week because I'm super prepared now. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. So this is what is race in algorithmic discrimination on the basis of race. I'm going to start off with this uh, court case. Um, in August 2018, the United States uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, that's HUD, filed a housing discrimination complaint against Facebook um, alleging that the company's algorithm-based uh, al advertisement system, quotes, mines extensive user data and classifies its users based on protected characteristics, and thereby, quote, unlawfully discriminates by enabling ad advertisers to restrict which Facebook users receive housing-related ads based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, and disability. Uh, Facebook, responding to this complaint, pointed out that its machine learning system does not even make use of a race feature, so it doesn't even have the ability to target individuals based on race. But this line was unconvincing. In March of the following year, uh, HUD put forth an actual charge of discrimination. The earlier was a complaint, and I'm going to read the text in its entirety here, but it's on the slide. But this is an excerpt. Respondent, that is Facebook, combines the data it has about user attributes and behavior on its platform with data it obtains about user behavior on other websites and the non-digital world. Respondent then uses machine learning and other prediction techniques to classify and group users so as to project each user's likely response to a given ad. In doing so, respondent inevitably recreates groupings defined by the protected class, by grouping users who like similar pages unrelated to housing and presuming a shared interest or disinterest in housing related advertisements, respondents mechanism functions just like an advertiser who intentionally targets or excludes users based on their protected class. Oh. So I think there are two questions that I wanna focus on here. First, we might ask, well, why does the algorithm reconstitute these protected class groups? Um, and I think some simple observ sociological observation and, and as well as observations about how machine learning works makes that quite clear, right? Uh, there are just sociological facts about how certain groups of people, what kinds of pages they tend to like, and also um, facts about clicking on certain, and apparently as long as the behavioral tendencies are true in the world, the machine learning system will learn them. So I think the first question um, I can kind of set aside I think the second question though is rather interesting, which is why does discrimination count as discrimination? So if we suppose that um, HUD's reconstruction of the events is, is in fact what is happening, why would this kind of behavior constitute discrimination? So I think this exchange between Facebook and HUD drills down on a critical point of contention 
in debates about algorithmic discrimination, which is what does it take for a database system to act on or on the basis of race? And here HUD proffers a negative proposition. They say, look, an algorithm can discriminate on the basis of race even when it does not have access to a race feature. So I wanna ask, the, my kind of talk today will be asking, you know, could such a bold claim be true? In what theory of discrimination, what theory of race would make it so? So I think database predictive tools like the ones at the center of the HUD versus Facebook case clarify an underappreciated problem for discrimination theory, which I'm gonna call the puzzle of algorithmic discrimination. Um, and I'm gonna refer, keep referring back to this as the puzzle. So this is really, we gotta keep this one in our minds here. And the question is simply this, when are decisions made on the basis of features that are correlated with race, decisions made on the basis of race? And I think this question is not just relevant to current uh, debates about um, algorithms. I think a version of it has dogged philosophers, uh, legal scholars for decades under the descriptor proxy discrimination, in which an attribute uh, that is a proxy for race or sex or so on is used in decision making. And I think predictive machine learning simply kind of casts this old problem in new light, but also allows us, I think, to drill down on like, you know, what exactly is going on here that's making this so puzzling. So here is the roadmap for today's um, talk. So I'm going to set up the puzzle. I'm going to per pursue a solution to the puzzle, um, not by elaborating a distinctive account of discrimination, but rather a distinctive, a social constructivist account of race. And I'm going to especially talk about um, a subset of social constructivism, which I'm going to call thick constructivism. And I'm going to show how that will offer a solution to the puzzle. And then I'm going to talk about some implications for discrimination theory more broadly. So let's set up the puzzle. Oh, setting up the puzzle. Okay. So the HUD versus Facebook case, I think, well illustrates a central dispute in cases of potential algorithmic discrimination, um, with each party uh, taking a distinct interpretation of this notoriously vague because of race clause that we tend to see in analyses of discrimination. So consider the following, I think, rather uncontroversial uh, but non-moralized analysis of discrimination, which I'm going to call RD. So X discriminates on the basis of race if X treats Y differently from how X treats or would treat some Z because Y supposedly has racial status R and Z supposedly has a different racial status R prime. So because in the literature tends to be read in two ways, um, on one reading, we're asked because refers to X's kind of uh, taking race as a reason for the differential treatment, right? So the reasons interpretation of because asks us to look into the considerations X took in acting the way that she did. Um, on another reading, because refers to X's treatment of Y as just being constantly affected by race in just a non-reasons way. So we're going to consider how race might have affected or played a causal role in how X treated Y, aside from being a part of X's reasons, perhaps even in a way unbeknownst to her. So I want to first set aside some easy cases of algorithmic discrimination. So I think that everybody would, I hope that everyone would gather that sort of co covert intentions to recreate racial groupings uh, and then assign them differential ad outcomes on the basis of those groupings would be discrimination on the basis of race. Uh, and wrongful discrimination on the basis of race at that. So uh, for the sake of argument, I wanna set aside those cases where there's like, you know, a band of engineers in the background doing something. Um, I also wanna set aside cases where the algorithm explicitly has a race feature, because remember, this is the, the kind of key point of Facebook's defense. They didn't even have a race feature, right? And I, this is a bit of a simplification, which um, I'll continue, I'll talk more about later on, but I don't want to have to develop a full account of what it takes for a machine to take something as a reason. So I'm just going to say, look, look now, you know, take, in fact, that, that'll be the only way that, the, that it can take race as a reason. For now, I'll, I'll make that stipulation and then that simplification, and then I'll kind of go, go on to, to revise it. And that's because I just want to make, I want to set aside kind of more complicated reasons, or sorry, more complicated accounts of what it is to take something for a reason. Um, okay, so the, the really, the tough cases are cases when the race feature is not in the machine learning algorithm or machine learning in the database, and there's also not these covert intentions, right? 
I think for these cases, the reasons versus causes framing exposes a rather deep fault line, right? You go, you go for the reasons uh, view and it would seem that algorithms never discriminate on the basis of race. I mean, so long as they don't have the, the race feature. But if you go with the causes interpretation, it looks like if, at least if the machine learning system is working properly in many cases, they almost necessarily discriminate on the basis of race. Right, like race just causes the effects so many um, aspects of our lives. I want to set aside the reasons account because I want to talk a little bit about uh, the the literature, the kind of more technical literature on, on um, the causes account, which there, there's been quite a bit on. So scholarship on algorithmic discrimination has overwhelmingly advanced a version of this causal interpretation. And I want to say a little bit about why um, I find these accounts to be lacking, but I'm happy to discuss this more in question in Q and A. Um, so I can't fully address the full breadth of the scholarship, but I wanted to kind of acknowledge it for, for especially computer scientists who are maybe quite familiar with um, causal fairness or causal counterfactual accounts of fairness. So there's this uh, there's of literature on um, what's called like path specific accounts of fairness where really what the the algorithm what the um, the kind of framework is to think about this causal diagram of how race affects all the other attributes in your data system and then to designate which causal pathways are bad and then to say my algorithm's computation is not going to take into account those pathways I think the problem with this approach is that the grounds that you need to identify those suspect pathways, they can't come from solely within the causal framework. And I think most work in the area concedes as much, um, but, and they submit that the task of de designating the, the um, unfair pathways should be, um, should be just directly drawing on normative considerations. But I think this suggestion is simply unresponsive to the puzzle of algorithmic discrimination as I framed it because that calls for a descriptive account of what it is to act on race, right? Setting aside any particular moral theory about why acting in that way would be wrongful. And I think skipping to a moralized conception of discrimination actually overlooks what makes algorithms so interesting in the first place, because oftentimes we're asking like, did the algorithm even act on race, right? Like that's kind of the thing that's at the, at the heart of this uh, HUD versus Facebook case. So I think, so I think just kind of going the moralized direction kind of misses it. Furthermore, though, I think any such method that does aim to provide a descriptive account is only able to pick out those pathways that count as acting on the basis of race in light of a fundamental theory of race, right? But I think causal, causality-based approaches have been largely silent on these matters of metaphysics. I think causal counterfactual approaches, um, and, and if, you, if you're not familiar with these, um, I'm almost done here. Causal counterfactual approaches also, I think, suffer from similar silences. You know, in virtue of what facts do we decide what the relevant counterfactuals are? Or what are the counterparts of certain features in our, you know, non-discriminatory possible worlds? I think there, too, a theory of race is required to even get the method off the ground. Just saying that race stands in an important causal relationship with a given feature doesn't by itself make any headway in determining whether acting on that feature is acting on race, unless that observation works from an account of race in light of which that feature and causal relation are privileged over others. Okay, I'm going to really quickly mute my video because there's a train passing by. Okay, so the principal issue with these approaches is not just that facts about causation don't give us enough information to pick out, you know, the, the race features from the non-race features, but it's that any implications that these uh, approaches have for solving the puzzle will just depend entirely on the theory of race that they posit, right? And a theory that I think that the approaches themselves can't deliver. So I think the disagreements across the different solutions to the puzzle stem from disagreements about what race as a social category um, and uh, I do want to say, though, causal approaches are in fact suggestive of an account of race, right? They highlight a picture of race as producing causal effects in the world. Uh, and they suggest, in doing so, they suggest that what race does is a key feature of what race is. 
how is it possible that there is another train? I'm sorry about this. I wholeheartedly endorse this proposal of thinking race uh, to be a social cause, but I think we need to think really deeply about what kind of a social cause it is. And I think there a social constructivist account can Okay, well, surely there won't be another one in the next 15 minutes. All right, so I think to make sense of a causes interpretation of discrimination on the basis of race, we need to elaborate an analysis of race as a social category that is causally efficacious, right? But I think the straightforward thought that race acts as a cause, kind of a race being just an individual attribute that kind of triggers certain responses, right? So the, the claim, the police person stopped Jamal because he was black, seems to suggest something like, at time T0, the police person perceives Jamal, perceives race, and then that triggers a certain set of behavioral responses that ends in the police person stopping Jamal at time T1. I, but I think this kind of causal um, understanding leaves kind of completely opaque the background conditions of the interaction, right? So why did Black have the causal effect that it did? Why did the police officer react the way he did with, you know, with stop and search rather than with pass? And I think if a causes interpretation of discrimination is primarily concerned with the systemic nature of racial disadvantage, then answers to these causal questions should explain why Black has the causal capacities that it does and why the causal capacities are configured in this way. Um, so I think that here, what we want is I think a picture of race, not as a kind of attribute that is perceived by, but as a social category that structures certain kinds of social responses. So an explanation of why Jamal being, Jamal's being black caused the police officer to search him or stop him has to address the fact that the Black carries social meaning, right? Or the, the concept of black is linked to, in, in America, um, con concepts of da you know, danger or violence. And I think we can't really understand how black acts causally, you know, causes the police search without understanding the origins of this representational content. And this is what social constructivism really highlights. Social constructivism highlights that the myriad causal powers of Jamal's being raised black are connected with the social kind of thing that being raised black is and how the category is socially constructed as such. So constructivists, they foreground this idea that racial categories are socially constructed to have the causal powers that they have, right? And socially constructed because of um, social and political forces continually shaping the boundaries of racial categories their meanings, and as a result, their, their causal capacities. And since races don't share any essential characteristics that naturally mark them off from each other, the divisions can only be maintained and produced anew by race-making institutions. So um, I'm going to use the example of police and the prison system in the U.S., though I'm not a scholar of policing and prisons in the U.S., and it, for people who, um, you know, want to learn more about this, which we all should, I think, um, this little like 20 second explanation isn't going to do justice to the work that so many scholars have done. And so just to name a few, um, Elizabeth Hinton, Ruthie Gilmore, um, Julie Kohler Houseman, like I'm happy to kind of give names. I think this work is really important and also don't want people to think this cursory explanation of it is, you know, kind of covers the expanse of scholarship. Um, but let me say a little bit about this, which is that the expansion of the American carceral system um, starting in the late 60s reinforced representations of blacks as deviants, as criminals, uh, as, as generally dangerous, and the rise in black crime, which was itself a product of race-laden policies, further justifies certain policing practices, right? Practices like racial profiling, such that blackness can be, becomes both equated with criminality at this you know, micro level of everyday social meaning and, and police interaction, but also this macro level of legitimized racial policing policies and just general policymaking rationale. And these effects have spilled over in the past 50 years and in many other spheres, that making Blacks further socially, economically, and politically marginalized in very, in highly specific ways. And the concept of race is thereby further embedded in our society, figures into new and different non-accidental generalizations, and asserts new and different causal pressures on Black lives. 
So I think a further way to flesh out this critical constructivist project is to think about race as essentially hierarchically constructed. And I'm going to call this kind of strand of constructivist thought thick constructivism. So for instance, Sally Haslinger, uh, for Sally Haslinger, you know, race uh, and gender are social positions, wherein certain characteristics of phenotype and ancestry, uh, in the case of race, justifies certain kinds of differential treatment and positioning. Um, so she says, quote, racial oppression or racial oppression is directly connected to correlations of race. So she writes, group domination and the effects of earlier injustice position subordinate groups, socially and economically so, that their members have much more in common than their group membership. And I think seeing that the race structure as a hierarchical structure means seeing continuity in how blacks are subordinated, even if the particulars of that subordination might vary by historical moment. Because the category is essentially constructed in such a way that black individuals occupy a social position that is defined by a set of norms and expectations that is as a whole oppressive. And I think this fact of racial oppression connects directly with the correlations with race issue at the heart of the puzzle of algorithmic discrimination. Because these correlations, you know, robust non accidental correlations between outcomes of disadvantage and the black label that we often see in, in um, machine learning and, and data sets generally, they're simply just manifestations of an unjust race structure at work. So the thought is, look, if races are constructed as different, then seeing these consistent non-accidental correlations with race are, just, are not just kind of unfortunate statistical regularities that you know, algorithms have to find a way to skirt around, in order to not, you know, not to discriminate. But I think they track empirical facts descriptive of what races qua thick social positions are, right? What it is to be raced in the first instance. So for the thick constructivist, the racial category black is defined in reference to its overall position of disadvantage. So, for instance, to be black is to be marked on the basis of one's phenotype and supposed ancestry for certain norms, expectations, and practices of subordination. And I think different thick constructivist accounts can be distinguished by the kinds of subordinating factors that they're emphasizing and defining the category. So, for instance, uh, Du Bois in Dusk of Dawn, he has this dialogue that he, he's speaking with a white interlocutor, and the white interlocutor asks him, what is this group and how do you differentiate it and how can you call it black when you admit it is not black? And Du Bois responds, he says, the black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. And he therefore, he, he thereby defines black by its relationship to legal institutions of racial subordination. Paul Taylor expands this kind of thick constructivist like approach to the race concept more generally. So for Taylor, Races are probabilistically defined populations that result from the white supremacist determination to link appearance and ancestry with social location and life chances. So notice in these accounts that race continues to be a causal factor in individuals' lives, absolutely, right? Being marked black causally subjects ind black individuals to certain types of social treatment. But the constructivist account is um, of the category is constitutive because black is in, in fact defined um, as to be black is to define to be standing in some relation to social factors and social agents. Oops, sorry about that. So taking this view, we would kind of, exp you know, if, if we have, for instance, an example here, being black is partly defined in terms of standing, one standing in a certain relation to institutions of policing, right? If we took this view, then we would expect policing data to be racially skewed. Right, a positive correlation between the features black and past searches by police doesn't just expose a causal effect of one, an individual as being marked black, but a descriptive effect about what black is as a social category. And if we kind of continue on thinking about the racial hierarchy, racialized policing institutions actually forge a distinct pillar in that racial um, hierarchical race uh, structure. And so they partly actually form the thick social position that is the category black. And you know, if you take this view, then there is really no clean distinction between something as race are kind of itself and the, com the complex of social factors that constitute the thick social position of race are. Okay, so um, 
I want to make a few caveats and clarifications before I get to the up, upshot um, at this point. Uh, I want to first say that a thick constructivist account of race doesn't need to take all non-accidental correlations with the feature black to be constitutive of the racial category black. Um, I think some, I think I would posit like most causal effects of being la labeled black and encountering the world as black are not defining features of the category. But I think the question of which ones are essential and which ones aren't is an important conceptual. And I was just like a political question that isn't reducible to data mining, right? So I, I don't want, I don't mean to suggest like, oh, constitutive, you know, those features that are constitutive are the ones that exhibit the strongest or most robust correlations or anything like that. I also, um, you know, a potential um, objection might be, well, you know, doesn't a feature need to be kind of perfectly correlated with the racial label black in order for it to be kind of this essential um, constitutive feature of the category? Um, and I, I want to say no, and I think this is because standing in certain relations of subordination to policing doesn't mean having to have certain kinds of policing outcomes, right? So not every individual experiences those um, subordinating relations in the exact same way. But I think that doesn't mean that subordinating, standing in a subordinating relation with to um, policing isn't um, constitutive of the category, because I think in fact all um, black individuals, qua black individuals, do experience race-based harms and injustices uh, because of policing. And I can talk more about that maybe in, in the Q&A. And the last thing I want to say, um, which again will, will sound very cursory because I think a lot of work should be dedicated to this, is that, you know, intersectional theorists, intersectionality theorists have, you know, urged um, us to break out of single axis thinking, right? Like thinking that there is on the one hand, you know, the, the race hierarchy and then the gender hierarchy, and you can kind of like just add them up to, to think about um, oppression at, you know, at the intersection. And I, I want to say that that's absolutely not the case. And I think that constructivism um, w must be developed further to kind of account for intersectional social categories. Um, but I think that that's going to require a ton of other work um, and d deserves its own kind of dedicated attention. Okay, so what is the cash value of this? So I think with these theoretical resources in place, I claim we can elaborate a causal analysis of discrimination on the basis of race that answers the puzzle that I set forth at the beginning of this talk. But I think we need to understand how race acts as a cause in the right way. And I think the right way is an understanding advanced by the thick constructivist account. So here it is. When it comes to algorithmic decision systems, discriminating on the basis of features correlated with race constitutes discriminating on the basis of race when those features are not merely causally related to, but constitutive of the racial category qua thick social position. So, let's kind of run through an example. So, you know, thick constructivists define being black in terms of a certain set of supporting social factors. So here, maybe black is a thick social position whose occupants are probabilistically more likely to, and I, and I have some examples here, be on the receiving end of a stop and frisk action, be a victim of state violence, and so on. Now, here we have oh, social facts in, in this box. There are social facts that constitute the racial category black qua thick social position. And I want to say that acting on the feature black in a data set and acting on these features, the features in this box, are kind of the dividing line between those for the thick constructivism, the constructivist is not really there, right? A thick constructivist um, might see that an algorithm that includes the race, race feature and an algorithm that includes these features that exhibit non-accidental correlations that tracking the social facts that are constitutive of being raised or might both be discriminating on the basis of race. And I think this helps us understand something that I think maybe many of you might have heard in discussions about algorithmic discrimination, which is this, this um, claim that an algorithm can learn race even if you exclude race, right? And I think the thought here seems to be that insofar as race leaves its marks, leaves its mark on so many non-race features, keeping those features around in the machine learning pipeline is going to contribute to certain racially biased outcomes. I think the thick constructivist interpretation is to interpret the claim quite literally. It literally learns race. It learns via these correlations with race what race is, 
and acting on the basis of correlations produced by social facts that constitute race qua social position just is acting on the basis of race because races just are our social positions that subject their members, uh, member individuals to this matrix of privileging and subordinating social relations that are just precisely what it is, you know, define what it is to be raced. Okay, some implications for discrimination theory. I know I'm at the half hour mark, so I'll kind of try to run through this um, rather quickly. I think I only have like two slides, maybe one slide for, I think one slide. Um, I think there are a lot of implications for discrimination theory more broadly. I wanna discuss a few here. Um, so I think one place where the standard machinery of discrimination theory seems to malfunction is this commonly held distinction between direct and indirect discrimination. Um, you know, kind of to, to, to explain that distinction rather roughly, which, which there's still like scholarly debate about how best to characterize it. It's, you know, the thought roughly is that indirect, indirect discrimination um, kind of against blacks harms blacks, but not by kind of acting on race itself, but it has some negative disparate impact on the group, right? So for instance, you know, because blacks have been more often been subject to certain subordinating policing practices, they indirectly bear the brunt of other policies that kind of use those police encounters as a decision-making criterion, right? That's an indirect kind of discrimination. But if, as the thick constructivist holds, the category black is defined in terms of those social facts that constitute the position in a hierarchical race structure, then the gap between acting on being black and acting on having been targeted by violent policing practices narrows significantly, right? It seems to act on black in an important sense, one that challenges the idea that uh, doing so only acts on being black kind of indirectly. Um, I also, you know, I said, you know, here's this account, it solves the puzzle. And I want to give you a quick reason or two for why we should adopt the thick constructive as account. I think that the accounts of our social categories, um, you know, should be constructed with certain theoretical and practical goals. And I think the thick constructive as account has, you know, gives us payoff. And let me, I'm going to work with an analogy to economic class, okay? To show that I, I think the thick constructive as account like gives us theoretical and practical payoff. So suppose I'm an orthodox Marxian and I take class to be defined as um, in orthodox objectivist Marxian terms. So I think your economic class is 100% established by your relationship to the means of production. So under capitalism, you're a member of the proletariat or a member of the bourgeoisie. And I discover that what Marx called being a proletarian is correlated with having a long working day, limited personal property, and being um, subject to behavioral control on and off the job. I find that my algorithm can predict with great accuracy which of these individuals will experience financial hardship in the next months, and that the people who will um, experience financial hardship, it's heavily skewed towards those labeled proletariat, even if I remove the class category. So I think one interpretation is says, okay, well, being a proletariat causally, you know, influences you having a long working day and so on. I think this conclusion is fine, but it, it seems unsatisfying and maybe even a little bit wrong. It seems that when I use an algorithm to draw on the fact that you frequently experience financial hardship and behavior discipline, I act directly on the fact that you are in a particular precarious and subordinated position within the economic structure. Right? A distinctive social position that perhaps warrants attention as a class category. But this thought isn't really available to me if I'm kind of pre-committed to the Marxian account. Right? And then I, I can't, kind of can't see that, in fact, these features, in fact, constitute a really um, important category of theoretical interest. And it seems right to me to say that if I deny you social benefits on the basis of the fact that you have a long working day, limited personal property, and are subject to behavioral discipline, that I'm doing so on the basis of your class directly. And I think this is a claim that we can make on the thick constructivist conception. So that example is just to show, I think different conceptions of our categories bear different theoretical and practical or normative fruit. Um, and I think the thick constructivist category um, would serve us well, in, uh, both theoretically and in many of our political projects or many of my political projects. Um, I also think, okay, this is really one minute now. I also think that thick constructivist, um, the thick constructivist account of race shows why acting on the basis of race is often wrongful. So um, in 
come from discrimination theory, there's the question of what the wrong making feature of discrimination is. I think if you take a fit constructivist account, uh, it's kind of clear to see how acting on the basis of being black is demeaning, as Deborah Hellman would say is a wrong making feature of discrimination or compounds injustice or reinforces hierarchy, um, as Gary Peller would put it. So I think it kind of connects the descriptive and the non, or sorry, the moralized and the non moralized quite well. And the last thing I'll say is that there are really serious practical limitations of talking about certain features as only causally related to and not constitutive of race, qua thick social positions, and that cashes out in a, a series of really horrible, in my view, judicial decisions in discrimination cases in the U.S. Uh, context. And I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A, but I'll leave that at that. Um, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to go a bit over. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lily. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, I realize I didn't introduce my own self, which is, so I'm Shelley Adamson, the Chief Operations Officer of the HMI Grand Challenge. Um, and what I'd like to do right now, though, is hand over to Sarita Rosenstock, the a research fellow at HMI, and she's going to moderate our Q&A. So Sarita, would you like to take over, please? Thank you. Hi, everybody. So uh, today I'm going to start by calling on our interdisciplinary panel um, who's associated with the HMI group here. And then I'm going to move on to audience questions. And so you can uh, ask the question in the Q&A function here. And you can either, I can either read it for you or uh, you can ask it for yourself, just indicate in the question. Um, so I'm going to start by calling on Atuza, who's a, um, another research fellow here with the HMI group uh, based in the computer science department. Atuza. Uh, hi, Lillian. Thank you so much for the great talk. So um, I'm, I'm totally on board with the defense of the thick constructivist account of race. And I think maybe that's the right way to think about race if we are thinking about like ontological questions about race, right? But what I'm a little bit fearful is that if we, it, like imagine we want to apply this notion, which is a correct conception of uh, metaphysics of race to the case of Facebook, like the example that you started. Um, and so the worry is that if we adopt this, this like very socially kind of picture, it could be that in a couple of legal systems, um, it wouldn't allow us uh, or it wouldn't allow the legal system to demarcate when uh, this notion of race or basically when there was a racial discrimination or not. Because at some point, maybe you can, you know, if you say that, okay, there's not much, uh, we don't need to have like very strong correlations between features, uh, particular features and the notion of race or any other social category, then at some point we can end up like saying that, yeah, at some point, many different features are correlated with these social categories. And that seems to be a, a kind of a problem for for like legal decision making in practical settings. And I was wondering if you have uh, something to say about that kind of worry. Yeah, um, sorry, so I'm gonna try to phrase the worry and, and you can correct me if I'm getting it wrong. Uh, so the concern is if we don't have this kind of clear operationalization of the constructivist account that kind of maps on to correlations, then it might be in fact difficult uh, we might kind of have to like not have any uh, knowledge of w which features are problematic to act on. Is is that the concern? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that first, I think that there are a lot of um, first, there are a lot of like social scientists who are wor working on issues of race, both empirical social scientists and also social theorists who've studied all sorts of hierarchy. And I think that, you know, our conceptions of race have to kind of take into account historical as well as empirical phenomena that might not be borne out directly in things like correlations, right? Sometimes they will be. Like, for instance, policing really, you know, we can see the stark divisions um, in policing. But, you know, other, other kinds of cases of oppression are not so easily identifiable from the data. And I, I don't know, I, I don't want this to be hand wavy um, question, but I just think that it's something that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to come, come to like what, in what specific ways certain groups are oppressed and marginalized and keep note of that kind of cluster of social facts whenever we try to adjudicate questions about group inequality or group discrimination. And I think another thing to say that, about that is that we have to do this. 
we have to do this because this is part of, I can kind of squeeze in an, a response a little bit about my practical limitations because I write a lot about um, how race, reasoning about race and discrimination cashes out at the US legal system. And how it cashes out is that nothing is constitutive of race, right? And so all you need to do to show that there's no discrimination, the statistical, the econometrician comes in and waves their statistical wand and says, look, if I condition on neighborhood poverty rates, neighborhood crime rates, socioeconomic status, you know, if I condition on all these extremely racialized factors, there's no race difference at all. And it's true, you'll see this across in policing cases, you know, for the people from the US, Floyd versus city of New York, NYPD. That's a case where we had to ask whether stop and frisk was racially biased. And both sides said, look, if we take this thin account of race, you can condition on anything and ask what the marginal effect of race is. So I think just as a practical matter, you do have to decide what are the things that you cannot condition on as a matter of statistical practice because it is constitutive of race. So I, I think, you know, it, it might be hard to get at that question, but like otherwise we're never gonna be able to prove discrimination practically. Um, Thanks. Sorry if that didn't answer. All right. All right, so next on the queue, we have Colin Klein from here in the philosophy department. Hey, thanks, Lily. That was, can everyone, can you hear me all right? Good. Well, let's hope. All right, good. No, thanks. It was really interesting, like, I think much more subtle than a lot of these usually are. So I'm going to show, this is partly my contrastivist roots thinking about causation, but I, I, sort of thinking through this, it seemed like you were focusing mainly on this question of, is something discriminating and on the base rather than not? But it seems like in many cases, people care about some other contrasts. So just about two. One is, on the basis of race versus income. Um, and you know, you might put it in terms of like, does income completely screen off the effects of race? Uh, you might also care about, I mean, so you're quite focused on the US context and particularly African American experience. So I care, does it discriminate on the basis of race? So sometimes you can people say, look, it doesn't because we treat Jews and Asians fine. So I'm not discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, where really what you mean is African-American versus everyone else, or what you mean is white versus everyone else. Yeah. And I, I'm partly curious in the last one, because this is a, a kind of generalization question, because in Australia, we don't have a lot of African-Americans that mostly work for the State Department. Um, and the indigenous say, you know, they don't face heaps of in discrimination unless they're mistaken for indigenous people uh, who are horrifically discriminated against, but in a different pattern than the U.S. So some of this is trying to tease out how much the social constructivist account is just focused on that first question of race rather than not, or whether you get a sense of how it could be extended to cover the other kinds of contrasts as well. Yeah, that's a great question, thanks. Um, well, the first thing, which is race rather than something else, I think a lot of, and I didn't talk about this too much in this, in this talk, but a lot of my work is interested in like, well, what do you mean race and some non-race thing, right? Like race rather than, let's say like socioeconomic status, right? I think that um, for people who are familiar with these kind of perennial debates in, in the left about whether something is in fact a racial disparity or a class disparity, and oftentimes the way that these kinds of conversations um, cash out statistically is like, well, when I adjust for class, I, the racial disparity shrinks by this much. And the thing I want to say there is, is, you know, why would you think that in a society in which black and white people had the same wealth distribution, that we would even care, like, that, you know, how this phenomenon, let's say police brutality would affect blacks would even be the same, right? Like, why would you think that in a, in a world in which black and white people had the same incomes, that blackness in that world reflects what blackness in our world is today? So I think, so I, I want to problematize the, this, like, clean distinction. Um, a little bit. The second thing about, um, remind me, sorry, the second thing was generalizing, okay, generalizing. But, the or so black, ver so African American versus everything else, African American versus white, uh, economically successful minorities versus African American, you know, like you can carve this up quite a, a number of different ways, especially in the American context. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, for people who might be familiar, there's this, there was this case at Harvard, discrimination against Asians in admissions to Harvard, right? And I don't wanna give this more airtime than it deserves, but I, I've been thinking about this for a while. And, and part of the issue is like, 
we have a racial minority, in this case, Asians, but they're characterized kinds of attributes, like academic attributes. Um, and there's a question of whether acting on the basis of certain positive attributes or, you know, when we're acting against uh, Asians, right? Um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about racial discrimination is, is, it's, is the way I parse it is like, how do we treat similar people similarly given that they have one particular difference, which is that they're different racially, right? And I think the only way to fill in that question of given they're different racially is to kind of think about how these two groups in, in not just the black white case, but let's say Asians and um, Latinx people, how they are compared relative to certain like, for me, like certain material outcomes. And I think those kinds of axes really affect what it means to treat those groups similarly or differently. Um, but that's, again, to think about these groups as social positions that are constituted by certain uh, advantages and privileges and disadvantages and injustices. Um, but, you know, I do think it is compar I, comparative. It has to be a comparative um, question. E you know, e the default is not just like white, right? The default isn't just like how are you compared to white, but they have to be comparative across racial categories. I'm being a good interlocutor and letting other people ask questions. I have plenty more to say if no one else wants to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the um, so next I'm gonna call on Katie Steele from philosophy department here. Hi, Lily, thanks. Um, so yeah, I like your constructivist account of race and um, I took your point that we no longer on this account get such a clean distinction between direct and indirect discrimination. Um, but I mean, this kind of ties in a little bit with what Atusa was getting at earlier. There's still going to be a problem of a spectrum of directness of discrimination. It'll yeah. be sort of a continuum, if you like. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. a sort of causal, like maybe past criminal record is pretty closely causally yeah. related with what it means to be black. But then there's like stuff that's a bit further causally downstream from that, maybe credit history or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's still going to be a question of like where you draw the line, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I guess what I would say is, I, I think that the direct, I don't want to say that my account totally like eviscerates the direct and indirect distinction. I think it, you know, I leave space because a lot oftentimes the direct discrim indirect discrimination is cashed out as just disparate impact. So I'm going to leave room for the fact that you can act on correlations with race that are not constitutive that nevertheless produce disparate impact and say, I'm happy to take on board that that's going to be indirect. I also think there's a danger of subsuming too much. We want, we want this concept of discrimination to do too much for us. Often, I think the critiques of indirect discrimination are right when they, think, when they say something like, oftentimes we're concerned about distributive justice. And you know, things can be kind of wrong for many reasons, and it doesn't need to be because it's discrimination on the basis of race. It could be wrong or unjust as a matter of distributive justice, just as a matter of what people get. Um, so I'm kind of willing to say this might um, shrink the cases, you know, I don't feel a need to kind of make the concept of discrimination do a lot. Uh, if things are more causally distal, um, but they nevertheless have disparate impact, I'm happy to call them indirect discrimination. I'm also happy to um, charge that they're unjust on other grounds. I see. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, next is Will from the law department here. Thanks, Reva. And thanks, Lily. That was such a fantastic paper. Um, good on you. Really excellent work. Um, and I particularly liked it because I'm um, someone who's, who, who left philosophy about a decade ago and then went into law. And your paper was really... Um, it, it engaged it engaged with the nuts and bolts and the concrete aspects of law in a really admirable way, which is often lost in a lot of the engagements with this topic um, outside outside law faculties. Of course, law faculties have our own problems because we don't think about any of the conceptual stuff in um, a sensible or sophisticated way. But 
so thank you, thank, thanks so much for, for scratching that itch for me. I've got a comment and then a question. The comment is um, on the direct and indirect discrimination uh, division, as you put it. I, 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 I want to suggest that um, indirect discrimination or adverse impact, and I know that there's, there's overlaps between those ideas, but they come from a single source um, as a matter of history. I want to suggest that that, that is uh, formulated as a legal category to attempt to target direct discrimination in an absence of meaningful evidence of the mental state of the discriminator. And I'm not sure exactly what impact that has on, on your paper, but it seems that there's, there's, a, there's a weight attached to some kind of meaningful um, categorical distinction between the types of discrimination which are targeted by direct and indirect discrimination. And if you look at just, just as a, a matter of the kind of the raw intellectual history of the law here, you see it really clearly in the Griggs case uh, originated, that originated adverse impact. Um, that kind of consequential approach, or attaching liability as a result of consequential um, of consequences of actions which are discriminatory, uh, is, can be understood and, and I think should be understood as an attempt to say, look, we're actually targeting the mind, the, men, the specific mental process of the perpetrator, but we don't have sufficient evidence of that mental state. So we have to adopt a proxy and the proxy is group impact. Um, so that, that's the comment. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> uh, and it's probably a bit of a difficult question, um, how would you draft a discrimination statute which expressed a constructivist conception of protected attributes? Oh boy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um... That's a hard question because I'm asking you to be a legislator on the spot, but it, it's, it's just, it's a provocation um, to, to help to you to think about the positive matters. case. <laughs> um, I, so, okay. So in the U S context, okay, I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts cause I know we don't have that much time, but, um, I'm going to say something that perhaps seems like even more radical, but I don't, I think as a result of my willing to in, in direct and indirect discrimination is I'm kind of willing to give up on this like prioritization of mental states, this like racial animus mechanism that direct discrimination, like intentional discrimination tries to get at. I actually think that most, many cases of disparate impact, pure disparate impact, I'm kind of happy at, you know, if, if discrimination theory could be a lot of that, you know, I would be happy for that to kind of take primacy over direct discrimination. Um, and that's not directly responsive, but I, I do want to say something that your earlier comment made me think of. So people on here might be familiar with the Bostock case the US Supreme Court had just decided, which says that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender nonconforming status and trans status is discrimination on the basis of sex. I think that is quite, um, happy, you know, aligned with something I want to say here, um, which is there, I think there's a blurring of the lines of what it means to act on the basis of sex, uh, where it would seem that acting on, you know, how you dress would only be kind of causally related to rather than constitutive of, but it seems like the, the acting on gender nonconforming status, um, yeah, can be seen as saying, look, the way you dress is so, you know, how you present, how you dress is so, um, tied in with the category of sex that we're going to say that acting on the basis of that is acting on the basis of sex. And I think that's right. Um, sorry, Will, that, <laughs> that was me just shoehorning in the thing I wanted to say in response to <laughs> your difficult practical question, but I'll, I'll own up to it. We, we can, we can go bilateral on the difficult practical question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So next I'm going to call on Tiberio who is coming from uh, the Gradient Institute in Sydney. <clears throat> oh, hello, Lily. Thank you so much for such a lovely talk. Um, it's a, an in, uh, a subject that I'm very interested to learn more about. Um, I think my question is around um, if you, within this account, right, you know, how could you tell if you are making progress 
towards less racial discrimination would you know one way to think about it if you if you could conceive of a test that would determine whether racial discrimination had been completely eradicated which how would you think about that um which test would would you be would actually within this account uh be able to answer that question um or even incremental progress right because from the point of view of for example the, the facebook case you described and for any pragmatic purposes uh one is restricted to uh make decisions about uh make deliberations based on limited amount of information right and we need a uh, specific criteria to make decisions about you know whether we should do a or b and that hinges on notions of of what a, what a baseline is where are we today in terms of racial discrimination where we're going to be tomorrow in terms of racial discrimination for instance is there a simple test to within this account to answer the question of whether today we have more racial discrimination than we had last year even though today there's much more awareness than there was last year or five years ago so how would you respond to that um thank you um i think this question of how much racial discrimination there is in the world uh, or in the in our in a in a given society is a really important one and i think that um current accounts so okay let me start with this um in the paper version of this talk i kind of end on this this observation of the stark disparities in how for instance racial minorities in the u.s perceive the prevalence of racial discrimination and how white people perceive the pre prevalence of racial discrimination uh the pew you can like kind of every year that pew center does these surveys and they're they're astonishing we're talking about three times, four times the amount of, expect of racial discrimination that um, people of color say exists versus white people. So I think what this draws out to me is the idea of like that there is an objective number of amount of racial discrimination out there that an account can kind of like get a hold of is it's really challenging. And I think part of the reason that um, many of the conclusions kind of of, of my my paper or my, my talk here and how it might differ from standard accounts of racial discrimination is it makes at least i think on my account there is a lot more racial discrimination and i think a lot more uh, cases look like count as cases of racial discrimination um that i think other accounts miss and i think part of the problem to kind of put the discipline a little bit on blast is to say well, it's not surprising, right? If the thick constructivist account of race is true, then it wouldn't be surprising to see that there are actually material kind of differences in the perception of race and what kinds of cases are canonical cases that my theory has to get right and what kind, you know, how my methodology c continues, right? So um, that's to say, I think like this, this really important empirical question, like how much racial discrimination is out there I don't even know how to really respond to that because these stark disparities in, in the perceptions of ordinary people um, show there to be just, I think, not even overlapping, not just like empirical measurements are different, like people are exposed to more or less racial discrimination, but I think it shows that there might not even be convergence on a concept, right? Philosophers and legal scholars might have one concept of racial discrimination, but I think other people might have People, um, people of color might have a different concept. And I think that challenges the question of how much racial discrimination is out there, because whose concept are we trying to measure? Again, I don't mean to be evasive. <laughs> so we have one last question from Jenny in sociology before we move this conversation over into the Slack. Uh, sorry, hi, um, hey Lily, that was... Um, uh, fantastic talk. Um, really interesting. I really appreciate um, the things that you're thinking about and the way that you're integrating um, the sort of social critical lens with the technical issues of, of how we manage it. Um, and so I'll say that this question is also written in Slack. So if people are interested in um, talking more about it, since we've got, I think, a minute left, um, please come over and do so. Uh, but my question is this. So 
So given that race profoundly shapes life chances, which it does, and which I think, of course, underlies the thick reading of race, um, what if we put this idea of race as a reason back on the table, right? So it's already clearly a cause. Um, might highlighting race rather than trying to diminish its importance help us sort of think about unambiguously how race matters? And then potentially in both technical and social ways, um, mitigate racial disparities or at least sort of lay them plain, make them clear. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so in, I tried to cut out a lot of content, but in the paper I kind of say like, oh, it looks like I did a sleight of hand. Like I started talking about the causal analysis and all of a sudden I'm saying like, no, what it is to take, you know, act on race is to act on these other features. So now it looks like I'm doing the reasons analysis. Like what is this trickery? So like I try to acknowledge that a little bit. Um, but I think the, in the end, I think that I do want to advocate for, re, um, I mean, it's tough because like, I think it's very hard, our, our current conceptions of what it is to take something as a reason, they don't, at least the ones that, like at least how that is tends to be taken in conversations of racial discrimination are rather, uh, unsatisfying because you you talk about race as a reason and all of a sudden you're in intentionality world you're in like you know what was your mental state you know were you acting with the racial animosity mechanism on turned on or, or not like were you in fact in you know implicit bias land or were you act just acting i was acting on race i was acting on like their attire or something i think that that picture is is really unhelpful. So like, I don't, if I, if tying myself to the reasons view means to commit myself to this kind of intentionality, standard racial animus, racial prejudice view, I don't want to do that. But I want to, I, rather I want to say like, we need to have a better, um, a fuller account of what it is to act on the basis of race period, even as a reason. And, and I don't yet have that. Um, but I think that would require us to do a lot more um, thinking about how to revise what it is to take social categories as reasons generally when they're markers of really um, hierarchical so or social meaning. Um, and that requires just a lot more in-depth revision of, of reasons generally, um, which I didn't wanna have to dig through in this paper, but I'm, I'm absolutely interested and um, advocate for that project. <laughs>